Welcome back to the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. I am your host, Roberta. If you are looking to improve your communication skills, both professionally and personally, this is the podcast you should tune into. And by the end of this episode, please log on to Apple and Spotify, leave us a rating and a review, and what you'd like for us to discuss on this podcast. My guest today had a fear that so many people can relate to, which is one of the foundations of this very podcast. So many of us fear being in front of audiences and giving speeches. Public speaking, also known as glossophobia, has been rated as the number one fear that some fear even more than death itself. Liam Sanford is the author of Effortless Public Speaking, and founder of Creators Unwind. He's here to talk to us about how not only he overcame that fear, but how he's currently helping others to do the same. And before I go any further, please help me welcome him to the show. Hi, Liam. Hi, Roberto. Great to be here. Looking forward to this discussion. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. So I'm Liam. I am just an ordinary person who once upon a time had a fear of public speaking and it took a long time to overcome that fear and fairly recently put a lot of those learnings into a book called Effortless Public Speaking and there's so much in there from how to overcome the fear, how to conquer your mind and probably some of the things that a lot of the advice out there does does not help you with. Uh, so there's there's the piece for me of how to make public speaking effortless, which is a journey that has taken me a long time to to go on. Uh, and I love sharing that story with people, and also helping people become stress free speakers. So I would say that they're they're probably the things that that underpin me right now, Roberta. Um, like I said, you're a great fit for the show because a lot of people, that is their number one fear. And the thing about public speaking is a person can be confident in social circles, can be the life of the party even, but as soon as mm. they say, go and speak in front of people, something changes. What do you think that is in general cases? Obviously, everybody's different. So I think there's, there's a bit of psychology that, that almost says public speaking is standing on a stage in front of, you know, hundreds or thousands of people. And that is just a terrifying environment. If I think of that right now, that's still pretty terrifying. And there's a really important thing of making everyday conversation count as a relevant repetition and relevant practice to actually being able to deliver on stage. And I think that that is the missing connection. So what some see public speaking as, as being on the stage, I see everyday conversations as an opportunity for public speaking. It can be, you know, delivering a presentation at work. It might just be having a conversation with a colleague. It could be, you know, going out for coffee with a, a member of your family or, or a friend it could be asking for directions and I think the way in which you use the everyday interactions that you have can really impact what public speaking can be to you and often we over egg what public speaking is in our minds and that then creates a level of anxiety because we don't do it very often so if we reframe it to, you know, everyday conversations can be public speaking, then that's something we're doing all the time. We are constantly getting reps in. So when we come to deliver, you know, a, a big presentation or, you know, a job interview, or we are in a pressure cooker environment, which public speaking can be, mm. we are able to mm. recall doing it yesterday or doing it this morning in that conversation. And we, we talk about the concept of the nano speech in effortless public speaking. And a nano speech is simply a very quick, open body and close. And that can just be 10 seconds. It can be, hi, Roberta, my name's Liam. 
what's interesting to you what what are the things that the you know why do you get out of bed in the morning mm. and that can be a quick nano speech so you can do that when ordering a coffee that can be you know just as i've done in a quick conversation and when you use that and you can stack those reps together and make it easy for yourself to get public speaking reps in you can easily scale that nano speech from a 10 second burst to a two minute conversation to you know five minutes and then when it goes beyond that point you can stack nano speech upon nano speech and rather than closing you're just adding a transition to the next point and there you go you have a presentation and that's something that that i don't think a lot of people think about so the nano speech for me is is such an important concept that i certainly used when i had a fear of public mm-hmm. speaking around 10 years ago that's interesting that we do not make that connection that hey wait a minute i'm public speaking all the time <laughs> that's And right we don't make that connection and especially like you said if i'm ordering coffee i don't see it as me standing on stage and the barrister and everybody else is watching me order the coffee mm. there's something vulnerable and sort of being naked being on stage it's like everybody's watching you it's almost yeah. like a scarlet letter moment where everybody's That's watching right. you and and everybody thinks well, what what am i what's going to go wrong people are judging me the spotlight is on me so we don't make that connection of the nano speech that i do this all the time yeah that's that's right and ultimately confidence is success remembered so mm. how easy is it for you to recall successful practice that you've had previously doing this thing and if public speaking to you is standing on a stage in front of a lot of people you don't do that very often there are not that many opportunities to do that and so when you start reframing it that every conversation has the ability to be a nano speech has the ability to be a public speaking rep you can build successful repetition after successful repetition so that it's easy for you to recall the success that you had yesterday doing the same thing or using the same structure so that when you turn up you actually are delivering at your best and the important thing here is that practice is is absolutely critical but what's really more important as a as somebody public speaking is recent repetitions because if i got all that practice in 3 4 years ago that was 3 4 years ago that's going to be hard for me to recall that success mm. so making it easy for yourself and building in recent reps before public speaking or an important presentation or a, a job interview or whatever other important event that you've got is so important to make sure that you're not leaving your performance up to chance so if i have a speaking rep uh, a, a speaking event coming up in 2 weeks time every day in the next 2 weeks i will be intentionally using the nano speech and intentionally finding opportunities for public speaking so that when i turn up it's easy to recall those successful reps and i will be as confident as i possibly can be certainly yes confidence comes from knowing i've done so much and of this and so many times and i got this <laughs> it it actually even in, you know better as your attitude in a sense now that's right why would someone as young as you look decide that public speaking is something you wanted to focus on because usually like you said it's either required by the job it's mm. for the interviews or you know especially with job ones because that's mostly people that we work with they would go i like my job and if my boss didn't give me an ultimatum to go make this presentation i choose i wouldn't choose it it's something i have to do why would yeah. this be your focus because you don't look like you're old enough to be in a position where they're like liam your job depends on this go make this presentation <laughs> so about 10 years ago i was sat in a university lecture theater and the lecturer announced 
I'm going to be picking on people to speak today. I'm going to be asking questions. You've got to answer it. Now, my heart started racing. I had sweaty palms. I, my face was visibly sweating and people could probably see that I was uncomfortable. Now, the more people that got picked on to speak, the more I wanted the floor to open up so that I could just leave the room. And I didn't get picked on to speak that day. So I didn't have to actually speak in public. But just at the thought of having to talk in front of a room of maybe 30 people, I was overwhelmed. I was incredibly uncomfortable. And something needed to change. I knew that there was going to be more that more times that this was going to happen, more occasions. And I didn't want that feeling every time. So I started being intentional with figuring out how can I do this in a way that people don't see me sweating, where I don't have my heart racing and that I can just feel comfortable answering a question or you know talking in front of people. So that was the uh, a trigger moment for me. And, so and I went on a bit of a journey ahead. figuring it out. No, go ahead, sorry. I was uh, so I went on a bit of a journey to figure it out, and I I decided that I was gonna you know start small and then scale up from there. And it's it's the best thing that that I've done because speaking really is everywhere. Like you say, most people are forced into it in their job. But but if you think about it, there's in big life moments, there are things that, that you've got to do that, that you don't necessarily want to do. Speaking is everywhere. Mm. What if you could make that so that you can do it effortlessly? So the job interview doesn't feel so overwhelming. So that if you have to deliver a presentation to a board, that doesn't feel fill you with dread and it, it doesn't mean that you can't deliver effectively and a lot of it comes from the ability to in the moment be calm and focus on just two things what you need to say and your connection with the audience and I think when you can get to that point that's where speaking can go from something that you know you can do but it's a little bit stressful to something that you can deliver effortlessly can you walk us through what went through your mind at that college class when you thought you were you would be picked as one of the people to speak? What were those fears? What what did you imagine? What was the horror movie playing in your mind? So the the big thing for me at that point was what if what if I get it wrong or I say something so stupid that everybody laughs at me? And it's it's almost that that thing of social acceptance from the group and it's it's very easy in education in particular to be branded through one moment mm. so I had uh, I was probably fearful that if I got it so wrong that would be what I become known for by that class of people and I think education is quite often the first experiences that people have with speaking in front of others. And it is such a horrible environment because you almost can't get it right because the like people tend to either laugh at you if you, if you are amazing at it or if you get it horribly wrong and you kind of need to be in that gray area in the middle, but that's not necessarily the thing that's going to you know work for you throughout your life and your career. Um, so that's probably what was going through my mind at the time, other than I just need to get out of here because I'm so uncomfortable. Mm. You, so you will fear that they will make fun of it. And you're right. You know, we had those oral exam, present your literature summary. And yeah, if something goes wrong, you, that's even during break time and recess, the kids are going to make fun mm. of you. That's right. So those fears, were you afraid? Had there anything been given to your class to prepare before being asked to speak? No, 
not at all. So there was zero preparation. We didn't know that we were going to be picked on to ask questions. Okay. So that fear, you could sort of say it's kind of justified because we usually encourage people to say, if you, if you know your speech, if you've prepared, like you said, for the next two weeks, if I'm speaking, I'm going to be practicing every day. So you didn't have a chance to practice and feel comfortable enough with your material to say when the lecturer calls me right now, I know what I'm going to say. So that's, that's kind of not an unfounded fear, so to speak. And then secondly, the ones that were called out, in general, how did they perform and what was the class's reaction? So I think they, they were absolutely fine. And if I'm perfectly honest, in that moment, I was so overcome with overwhelm that I probably wasn't paying that much attention to the actual responses that other people were given. So, and I think this is a really interesting point to, to go down because a lot of the fear of public speaking comes from, you know, that fear of judgment or fear of being the center of attention. And the reality is that probably 50% of your audience is not listening to you or they're not fully focused on you because their thoughts are elsewhere. They have other things going through their mind, whether that's, you know, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? I hope the traffic's not bad on the way home. For me in that moment, it was, I need to leave here because, you, you know, I, I don't want to be picked on to speak today. And so an understanding of not being the center of everybody else's universe is a really important thing in being a speaker. Not to say that 50% of your audience is not listening to you, but actually to remove some of that pressure that you are the focus of them and the sole focus of everybody in your audience, because they are not judging what you look like. They are not judging what you're wearing, how you sound, how many pauses you've inserted, how fast you're speaking. The reality is they are there to gather the information from you. And they may have trails of thought that send them down another path. So I find that a, a little release of pressure because rather than, you know, a hundred eyes on you in a room and everybody is, you know, meticulously looking for a moment where you mess up that's just not the reality mm. um so i think it's a it's an interesting route to to go down because we we are the center of our universe every thought that we have comes from our brain with us in mind at the core of it that's not the same for everyone else they are the center of their universe mm. so i think understanding that in the context of public speaking you can you know give yourself some slack because you're not going to get those judgments and really that the worst that you think might happen is is a million miles away it's mm. very unlikely that's interesting because usually when we talk about the audience not judging you we usually say they are rooting for you actually to succeed. They are, because like you said, they are, you are bringing them the information they need. You know, your classmates were talking about whatever lecture series that mm -hmm. was. So they are hoping that you will do well because the information you're bringing is going to benefit them. Yeah. So nobody wants you to mess it up because they think, oh my goodness, after this lecture, I have no idea what we're going to be tested on. Nobody's thinking like that. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the, the way that, the, that I framed it in, in that way almost brings it back to you being the center of your universe and it brings it back to you being able to calm your mind. So I've heard some people say, you know, and, and hearing the, you know, the audience want you to succeed, that still comes with the pressure of, well, what if I don't succeed? Hmm. So reframing it it certainly went 10, 10 years ago when I was in that in that situation reframing it to go actually the majority of the people here don't have their full focus on me 
that that removes a little bit of that pressure because you know that that gives me makes me more relaxed it makes me more likely to be able to deliver at my best and i think like when you're the speaker it's never about you it is always about the audience but how you calm your mind is so important because if your mind isn't calm you're going to be a chaotic deliverer of, of your presentation or your speech and so it, it's such a critical piece of the puzzle um so how you manage your mind is going to be individual to you um but being able to relieve some of that pressure is is so important to be able to deliver at your best that's actually a very good point because yes when you feel pressure, you know, it's almost like even your brain freezes. You know how during exams, if it, it, you literally have a brain freeze, you forget stuff mm. you knew just because the, the pressure and the anxiety just takes over. So that, that's one way you can have a coping mechanism, like you said, to take the pressure off and think, hey, you know what? They're not all focused on me for the entire 45 minutes. <laughs> so let that's me right. focus on what I need to do. You know, so many that that's actually the first time that I've heard someone put it that way to say that this was my coping mechanism and and, and, it, and it works, you know, so there are so many ways that you can take the pressure off. So you focus on the job at hand. And then when you started, so you said you started this live tweet, was it was it live Twitter? Um, yeah, Twitter spaces. Content? live Twitter spaces. Would you like to yeah. walk us through that? Absolutely. So for anybody who's not heard of Twitter spaces before, it's it's basically a, a big conference call that anybody can join at any time. You can start a Twitter space on any topic and everybody on Twitter can see that that it's it's live and is is a, a live event. So within Twitter spaces there is no video so you are audio only and there is no pressure to speak whatsoever you can join as just a listener and you you know you probably have a a host or a co-host now i started uh the the public speaking twitter space with my co-author um because we both had an interest in it and and we connected via twitter so we decided that we were going to, you know, share some some tips and, and some stories that we have picked up in, in our years of public speaking. And we didn't expect it, but 150 people turned up to that first Twitter space. We, we looked at it and so at the end, someone said, you know, is this going to run again? So at the same time next week, we decided let's do this again similar amount of people turn up so this became a weekly event and it became an opportunity both for people to speak and share their experiences of public speaking but also for people who were less comfortable speaking in public to get a first speaking rep in in a situation where nobody can see them they can have their notes in front of them and there is no pressure to talk for a long time. So we invited people to come to the mic and say, you know, hello, this is my name. And I just wanted to speak to get my first rep. In. And we gave people that framework. And believe it or not, we, we had loads and loads of people just do that at the end of our spaces. And from that moment, We had people come back and share their story. They did it in another Twitter space and then they started hosting their own. And all of a sudden we realized, you know, the power of a social audio platform where you can have your notes in front of you. And, you know, a lot of those barriers to speaking in front of people were removed. So we started it as initially as this is a great topic and, you know, we'll enjoy speaking about this to actually it becoming a forum where people will attend it again and again and again to share their journey, get their questions answered, and you know, also help other people along the journey of becoming a comfortable and a confident speaker in public. That is amazing. First of all, it's the first time I hear of live Twitter spaces. 
because usually you have LinkedIn having the audio rooms. Mm. You have okay, Instagram Live has been there forever. There's Clubhouse. Yeah. So I had no idea that Twitter got on that uh, bandwagon as well. And then the 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 one thing you mentioned, which is very key, is it's the first step they took, knowing they won't be judged. Obviously, nobody can see them. And, and so they're building these this confidence step by step, these baby steps that they're taking. What can you recommend for someone who probably doesn't have a Twitter account, <laughs> but they want to start and say, you know what, I like this idea that Liam is, 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 is sharing, but I'm not on Twitter. So if somebody is not on social media, for instance, what are some baby steps they can take to start practicing those nano speeches? So I would say, first of all, being able to do it in your most comfortable environment. So figure out what is your comfortable environment. Is that at home talking to friends? Is it at work in the office uh, over a coffee with a colleague? Is that via a video call? Is it via a phone call? And start getting nano speech reps in in that comfortable environment. So a lot of advice says, you know, throw yourself in the deep end and, you know, go and just deliver a presentation to someone. Now, I don't think that's helpful. Um, I think being able to get your early reps in, in a place that's comfortable to you is so important because you want that rep to be successful. So have a conversation with somebody using the nano speech framework get that successful rep in. They don't know that you're practicing your public speaking, which is the best thing about that conversation. And start building on it. Do a nano speech for 10 seconds, then do a nano speech for 20 seconds. Then maybe you want to change the topic and you start sharing about a different topic. And then maybe you want to change the environment. Maybe you've been doing it via a video call but you want to now do it in person. And I think there's scaling up of a couple of different things. There's scaling up of the different environments that you can speak in because virtual presentations are now a thing. Podcasting, like this is a public speaking rep for me. Um, and you can also then start thinking about what am I comfortable sharing and what topics do I want to be able to scale up my ability to speak in public on? Mm. And so I would start with low level conversations that last just 10 seconds, get in and get out because that's going to be the best way to build that successful rep that you can recall next time you do an NA speech so that you can build that confidence. It's like climbing a ladder and you're just going one rung at a time. And a lot of time we we live in a society today where people are looking for quick fixes, hacks, and, and just, you know, quick wins that doesn't work. If, if you, you know, don't build the foundations of being a speaker, the fool is going to be bigger if you try and, you know, skip a load of steps. So start small with the nano speech in just daily conversations then scale up and that's the point then when you can start you know branching out into different arenas and getting comfortable first then confident and then only when you're comfortable and confident do you then become a competent speaker Mm -hmm. when you're comfortable and confident is something you build up when i there was a, a linkedin live that i attended and the host was interviewing a guy uh, who's actually in Singapore. And he was talking about how, what, uh, I don't know how many years ago, but his boss actually asked him and said, you need to go and make this presentation to this potential client. He said, I was completely free. I literally tell my boss, I said, no, pick Liam, my colleague, for instance. <laughs> 
first of all, <laughs> imagine saying that to you, but like, I'm not going to do it, get somebody else to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but he spoke about, because he's been working for tw about 20 years, he spoke about how it became a hindrance to his career growth. The colleague that he said can be picked is the one who's career accelerated and got promoted instead of him because he wasn't willing to, but he realized that he needed to do something about it. Mm. Now that was his story. And as he shared his story, you can see the comments. The majority of the comments were, how do I get started? Why is not anyone telling me how to get started? How do I get started to speak for the first time? That's right. I, that how do I get started was the major percentage of the questions on the live as we were listening. Yeah, I, I can imagine. And I think there is so much advice out there that, you know, starts talking about advanced techniques and, you know, how long should I pause for and like, how, how long should I be on a slide for and all of these different things that actually if you just want to get started and you you hate speaking in front of people right now, that's all noise that's unhelpful. Mm. And, and I think that there's a, a really important piece of, you know, you don't have to throw yourself in the deep end. Just, just start small, get comfortable there, then go to the next level. And the the important thing here is to, start way before you need it now i i had someone reach out to me a few weeks ago and said i have the event of my life coming up and i got to speak in front of three thousand people and i have a fear of public speaking i don't know how to do it now the reality is that that's too late in the game <laughs> You're not going to do any you... speech practice with that. <laughs> I'm That's about right. to say that the nano speech sounds amazing. And like I said, you, you look very young. So you have you've had the time to build that up. But somebody like the guy on, on the LinkedIn Live I was on, if he needed to do that for his job within the next two days, he didn't have the luxury of starting in baby steps. That's so right. if you need, and, and those are some of the people that, that I work with, is that the deep end is where they need to get thrown at work and suddenly 3,000 people, Roberta, what do I do? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's so it, yes, yeah. you're right. You're right when you say start long before it's required. But if it's now, I have to do it for my job to keep my job. The deep end techniques, what would you say is a one or two that could work in order to, while you are doing the background work? So I gave, I gave the coaching client that reached out with this same problem, two very important specific things. The first is keep your preparation simple because then your delivery will be simpler for you. And there's, there's something really important that if you're delivering and, you know, being long winded with your message and saying a lot of words, that doesn't mean your audience will understand more. Actually, it leaves more room for interpretation. So being clear and concise in your message is the most important thing that you can do. So, I have a four bullet point framework that I use every time I deliver a presentation or a speech. So how am I going to open that is engaging and that doesn't run through an agenda, which actually is going to, you know, turn the attention away from the presentation. Second of all, what is the main point that you're going to deliver? If you can't get that down to one sentence, it is not clear enough. Mm. So your main point, you need to be able to deliver in one sentence. Then I like to attach a story to that main point. So what that story is going to help the audience remember that main point. And then the fourth piece, how am I going to transition to the next point? Or how am I going to close? Mm -hmm. That is not necessarily, a, you know, oh, I've, I've finished now and 
uh, I'd like to hear some questions from you, which is how most people in, in their presentations think about calls to action. Like I, I the, the example that, that I use with, with my coaching client was if you're, if you're asking them, you know, to sign up to your email list or you are asking them for what, what do they think your next steps are, which is a common one in, you know, promotion conversations and things in the workplace. You can almost shape it around to here are some things that I'm going to be doing next. What is it that you would advise me to do on this path? And that's a different way of handing it over for questions. Mm. Without, you know, oh, I finished and I'd like, I'd like to hear Anybody some questions. Anybody have any questions and then they ask you something so difficult sometimes? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's maybe exactly sometimes it. they don't even they don't even really want to know that you're just gonna throw you off i don't know but that's sometimes right. <laughs> when you say any questions they'll ask me a question where i go why would you even think of that after what i've spoken about? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly it and mm. so i i think basically the advice that that i would give is have something that you can open with that is really really strong that is not an agenda, something very different. And make sure that you can transition between points very well, because that's where your presentation is won or lost. Mm. Every time that you flick a slide is another opportunity for somebody to go, cool, that's more words on a screen that I don't want to look at and read. And read. so those transitions they are don't really wanna great read. points. Yep yep that's it to interpret yes don't if you put something where you're gonna just gonna read every single word like a novel a lot of people read fast they're gonna read faster than you then their minds are gonna go away from you take off the attention from whatever it is you're presenting so we usually advise i don't know if you agree that you don't put every single word of what you're gonna say and just read the slide oh, absolutely okay like if if somebody can get everything that you're going to say just on the slides, you may as well not be there. Just email them the email. presentation. <laughs> and like that, that, that's, that's something that, that I think is really, really important. Like you, you shouldn't make the slides for you as the speaker. The slides are for your audience. So if it doesn't help them understand better, then it shouldn't be in there. Like the, the slides are not the main event. You are the main event. The mm. slides are your supporting act. And I, I think it's it's so it's it's such a different approach, in particular in the in the corporate space where corporate world loves bullet points. But if you go more down the images route and you know just a couple of keywords on screen, mm -hmm. that's something that's gonna capture their attention they're going to have to listen to you because otherwise they don't know what's going on. So when you do email the slides afterwards, they need your narrative alongside it. You are the main event, not your slides. Mm. And that's, that's a, such an important message that I think gets lost in the noise of, you know, preparing for public speaking and, you know, trying to think about all of the million and one things that are going to be going on in that, in that public speaking event so don't make the slides for you make them for your audience that's right pictures and a few words i always say have like about two words at best for each bullet point words that strike curiosity but they don't yes. tell the whole story because you are going to be telling the story but if that's you right. have one word or two Per bullet point, people always say, huh, what is that? I wonder what she's going to say about that. Let's try curiosity. But if you write the whole story, like you said, the slides then become the main act. There, there's no point in, the, in you even being there. So what would you say would be the three main takeaways from your book, Effortless Public Speaking? Number one, the nano speech. Mm -hmm. Uh, I won't go into any more detail on that. I think we, we've covered the nano speech. 
Uh, number two, I think the importance of calming your mind. And a lot of the time that noise comes from, you know, a lot of the logistical things that are not actually to do with the speaking. And there's a lot of things around, is there going to be parking at the venue? Like, is my video going to work? What is the laptop going to work? And all of the technical things that, that come with that. And I think getting comfortable and getting those questions are answered ahead of time is really important to help you calm your mind. Um, and in addition to that, I would say, you know, when we prepare, everybody has a tendency to go over the stuff that you know really, really well. And you ignore the bits that might be a little bit more difficult. And I think that needs to be in reverse. The things that you know really, really well, like you're going you're gonna to know that. If you know it now, you're going to know it on the day when you come to speak. So start with the things that are going to be a little bit more difficult for you, a little bit more cognitive load so that you can get that off the plate so that you can go in as confident on those bits as the bits that already you, you know that you're going to talk about. Um, and I would say the, the third takeaway that, that stands out for me is storytelling and the mm -hmm. importance of it. So often people open with, you know, the agenda and, and those things that don't capture attention. People don't remember what you say, but they remember how you made them feel. And storytelling is the way to make them feel. So if you want your message to be memorable, you need to tell stories that are compelling. And I think the great thing about storytelling is that they don't have to be extraordinary moments. So if we think about our everyday lives, we get up, we have breakfast, we go to work, we come home from work, we make the dinner, we spend time with our family. The, generally speaking, that is the life of most people. Oh. Stories that you can tell that resonate with people are going to help make them feel and therefore remember your main points. So rather than an extraordinary story that people might not be able to relate to, create stories from those everyday moments yes. that almost everybody in your audience are going to be able to relate to. And that, that makes it different from just, you know, telling your story. You end up telling them their story mm. because they are imagining themselves right there with you. So if you can tell the audience their story and make them feel and then deliver your main point at that peak moment where they are right there in the story, there you go. That's impact because they're going to remember that. That's going to be the piece where they go home and they tell, tell their husband or wife, this, this person told this story today and it was amazing. And it didn't come from an extraordinary moment. And I think we, we do feel quite often that, you know, stories have to come from crazy different things. Sci-fi type of situations. No, that's not reality. Because we always talk about being relatable. If you tell a story that almost comes from a sci-fi movie, what makes you think anybody's going to relate to that? Yeah. That's right. They need to be relatable. Last words of wisdom, Leanne Sanford. So I would suggest, and this goes for all communication and all speaking, it's never about you. It's about your audience. And if you can communicate in a way that the other person receiving wants to be communicated with, you're going to better land your message. And if you tell stories from everyday moments, that's going to resonate with the majority of people. So use that to your advantage when you're delivering presentations because storytelling is the way to be someone that people resonate with but it's also the way to make your message resonate with them and stick with them long after you've done speaking words of wisdom from liam sanford the author of effortless public speaking and founder of creators unwind 
what what is the one thing you you feel like is a benefit for you as an entrepreneur for having learned these public speaking skills so as we've already said speaking is everywhere and i'm constantly connecting with other people uh, who are entrepreneurs and and creators online and i don't think anything of it now i've jumped on this podcast and i'm not overwhelmed i don't have a fear of public speaking anymore no. this was just going to be a fun conversation that we were going to have it is and yeah <laughs> like years ago i would have been so nervous and i would have been uncomfortable coming onto a podcast and the opportunities that have almost come in front of me through overcoming a fear of public speaking and going on to you know being able to speak stress free in public like it's it's amazing so it has opened doors because i'm able to you know step into opportunities and speak to people that i wouldn't have been able to do years ago and just just want to make one more point here about it which i think mm -hmm. is really important Go ahead. is that nerves are not the same thing as not having confidence so although like i can speak in public stress-free that doesn't mean i don't get nervous i still do so <laughs> that's that's right and i think people confuse the two so they think oh if you're nervous you're not confident but even though like as i said today like i i'm confident and i have i this, i've been able to do this conversation and this podcast stress-free i still had nerves at the start and can i interrupt a, you i had a guest who told me he, he i don't know whether he heard it from one of the producers who worked with michael jackson michael jackson was nervous before going on stage mm. about that <laughs> michael jackson <laughs> Well, that's right. <laughs> it if, didn't if you're not nervous, him, you're not challenging yourself. He, he still got nerves. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it's so it's okay to be nervous, just channeling them in a, in a way that, you know, turns it from I can't do this into this is a great opportunity and I'm going to show what I can do here. I think that that shift is is so important and you know, that is probably been the thing that, you know, has benefited me most in, in being an entrepreneur through learning speaking. And, you know, you don't know what opportunities are around the corner. If you can speak well and you can write well, the world is your oyster. It certainly is. And thank you so much, Liam, for learning to speak because it brought you to this show and we got to meet you and learn so much from you because your story is going to resonate with so many, you know, it's not a Captain America superhero story, but what <laughs> makes you a superhero is the fact that so many people are going through the very same thing right now. And you've given us tools in order to know how to take the baby steps to get to where we need to. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks very much, Roberta. Really enjoyed this conversation. I certainly did myself. And before you go, where can we find you on social? So we know Twitter. So please give us all your other social media handles. So you can find me on Twitter at Liam Sanford. You can find me on LinkedIn uh, just by searching for me. And you can find everything in my whole portfolio on liamsanford.com. LiamSanford.com. Thank you for being on our show today. Don't forget to subscribe. Thanks very much, My absolute pleasure. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a rating and a review on Apple and Spotify, and stay tuned for more episodes to come.